Okay. Now I think I'm I'm in it. So I'm gonna make a new project called Programming Intro. 3D Unity 2019 dot something. So cool. While well, the project's getting set up, and I wanted to do this alongside everybody instead of having it pre-built up, because I know that these wait times are always a bottleneck when people are trying to get started in a in a workshop. Um, if you already know a decent amount about programming, this might seem a little bit basic, but it's good to get back to basics sometimes. Um, I did want to dispel a few myths about programming to get us all in the in the right mindset. Um, you don't have to be a techie to program, like constantly great with technology um, or have like an epic gaming computer. I cannot operate a printer half of the time, but I'm a comp sci major. So yeah, if, if you want to program, you can just do that. You don't have to be super great with technology. Um, there's a myth that programming is not creative, and this is especially prominent. Um, people think this is a cold analytical thing, but it's not. It's a tool like any other. It, it would be like calling a hammer and a chisel not creative. Um, you use programming to do creative things. Some people might think if you don't get into coding early, it's too late to start because you look around at people and you see some people that have started programming when they were like two and could barely read. Um, and they <laughs> are like, you know, these, these prodigies, but you can start programming at any point in time. Um, and I linked an article in the outline to like people who started to learn to code in like their sixties and eighties. Like it's never too late to learn. Um, and that goes for anything, not just programming. You can always get into a new thing if you have the desire to do so. There's this really pervasive mindset that I think people people either express or people internalize, and it's really is really really bad in the industry that um, that some people programming is like not for some people because of their race or because of their gender or you know some other aspect of who they are as not true at all if you have any idea that that if any idea in your head that that's true you need to try and get that out of your head because anyone can program if they have the desire to do it absolutely anyone if you want to program you can program and that's the mindset that we should be in when we get started with this so now i'm gonna make a few cubes as one does in unity I'm going to name one of them floor and I'm going to make it uh, and make it big. I'm going to make a new cube. I'm going to name this player. Move it up. And we're going to select our player. We're going to add a component, new script. We're going to name it player movement. And we have a script here in the assets window of the project now. And when you double click on it, it will open it in Visual Studio, hopefully. So long as you have Visual Studio all set up correctly. I like to, in my projects, have a scripts folder and put the scripts inside of it. You don't have to in this little demo case, but it's, yeah. Oh, right. So if you move a script after you open it, sometimes Visual Studio can be wonky. So yeah, I like to have everything in its own folder for organization later. Let's break down what we've got here because this is a bunch of stuff that we may or may not know what it actually is. Um, we've got up here, we've got importing libraries. Um, and these are just resources from Unity. The syntax is using, and then the name of the library or package or whatever the, the term is, just bringing in functionality from Unity. Um, we have a declaring a class, which is 
what our script is doing. Um, and the class is just an object that has a state and functionality. So fields and methods, um, as you might know them. Um, and then we have here two default methods that come prepackaged in start and update. Uh, and we have comments, which are very useful. Uh, and will tell you what a function is supposed to do when you write it and then inevitably forget what you're doing, as happens in every coding project ever. To get a starting idea, let's just go ahead and type some code. Oop. Okay, so debug.log hello world. Um, and for right now, let's just see what it does by saving, control S, going into Unity, making sure our player has it on, yep, and hitting play. So if everyone has done this, uh, congratulations. You're now all programmers, no refunds. Um, you, you now are a programmer for life and you can never strip that title from you so long as you live. So um, just a quick reflection on that. Hello world is the first step in any language for like all programmers. Um, just the simple act of printing text to a screen is a way to clue in about how a language works. So right here, we know that debug is gonna be an object. We know that it's the Unity thing. It's from Unity Engine, which we imported here. You can see that with the tooltip. You know that dot log is a method, part of the functionality of that object. Um, and then we can see that we give it an argument, which is a string in this case, surrounded by quotation marks. And we end each line with a semicolon, as you would do in a lot of other languages. Um, so just from one line of code doing one simple thing, you can gather a lot about a programming language, whether it's in the context of games or any programming. Cool. So now that I've kind of gone on for probably too long about the importance of this step, let's make it happen several times a second. So take that code and move it into update, run your code again, and you'll see it's printing hello world a lot. As you might have gathered, um, the difference between the two functions that we get at the start of a script, start and update, is that start runs once at the very start um, when the object to which this script is attached is created. I believe that's right. Um, which in this instance is the beginning of runtime since it's already in the scene. And update happens once per frame while the object is uh, in the scene or is created. So what this means is that we have kind of a loop that's going on. Um, whatever is that you whatever you put in this function is going to happen infinitely until you stop the game and that's something called a game loop so to prove to you in case you think that i'm some sort of liar that it happens one time per second i'm going to add this code from the intro or from the outline uh, quality settings dot vsync count equals zero application dot target frame rate equals one um, this is something you could call boilerplate encoding, um, where you know kind of what it does. You don't necessarily know each little bit of it, but you don't necessarily care because you can copy and paste it and have it do the functionality that you want it to do. Um, so that code is in the outline. It's also right here if you need it. So now I've set the frame rate to one. And as you can see, it's printing once per second because that's every frame. Um, and you can prove it with the timestamps too, so just counting up by one. Also, the editor window can get a little weird when you limit the frame rate to one. That's the generic idea of start and update. And next, we'll get into um, making a full-on script to move around a player and do a bunch of stuff. 
for everyone here that was for the here for the intro to unity workshop you might remember the script that we had that had the player move around and tumble around and this is a really simple script actually so we're going to make that here and one of the main components of that is a rigid body so we're going to add a rigid body to our player by going to add component and it's it's in physics rigid body but if you want the um i never thought that oh wait there we go now it's not in the way all right if you want the pro gamer strat you can just of course type rigid body um and now we want to add a rigid body to the state of our object because right now it's just functionality just methods but we if the idea of programming is taking data and doing something with it which is what a lot of programming is then we need the data which we can do things with um, so to start with that we're going to write public rigid body rb and what we're doing here is declaring a variable um, by saying it's visibility public, which means we'll be able to see it in the editor. Your inspector might refresh. And yeah, there we see our new variable that we just made and a little box um, that we can now drag our rigid body into like so. Or or if you want to get fancy, you can drag the player object into this box. And Unity is smart enough to grab the rigid body component off of it since you're looking for that type of thing. So now we have that set. Yeah, rigid body is, of course, the type, um, which all the components are objects. They have state and functionality. Uh, and we'll be using that of this variable later. Next, we want to actually handle the movement. Um, and to keep track of the movement, we're going to use a vector. And we'll make this one private. And we'll say vector3 for movement. Um, and if you don't know what a vector is, have fun with physics. Um, a vector is a collection of numbers, usually two or three, um, that have components called x, y, and z, or just x and y if it's a 2D vector. Um, and to declare it, you use vector three, and you'll just set the components of it individually. That's actually a great point, Luke. Vector from Despicable Me describes it very well. What, what's the line again? He says, um, Direction, Mag and magnitude. Magnitude. Direction and magnitude. Mag With yeah. the hip thrust on that. <laughs> Can't forget the hip thrust. So in phys physics, a vector is a collection of numbers or a thing that has magnitude and direction. But arbitrarily, it's just a group of three numbers. So to give values to the different components of this, we can just say movement.x. And what we're going to do here is input dot get access horizontal and we'll do the same same thing for z input dot get access vertical and this might seem weird because you might think of y as the vertical axis um, but since we we're just moving our character forwards and backwards and left to right um, instead of up and down and left to right, we use the z-axis instead of the y-axis there. Um, and so this, this input.getAxis stuff is not intuitive right away. You wouldn't know to do this from the start. Um, movement in Unity, I've noticed there's like 50 billion ways to do it, um, getting input in C Sharp. Um, this is one of them. Uh, if we wanted to, there's a different way you could do it. You could grab, you could see which of the individual keys are being pressed at any given time, um, like looking for W, A, S, and D. And that is a thing that you'll see in some tutorials if you look at those. Um, but this input.getAccess is really convenient because 
uh, it takes input mappings from Unity itself. So this is going to work with, uh, these two are going to work with WASD, the arrow keys, and if you plugged in a controller, it would work with thumbsticks. And what's going to happen is that these will be a value from negative one to one. Um, so if you hit A, it's going to go negative one. If you hit D, it's going to go one for the horizontal. And if you hit W, it's going to go to one. And S, it's going to go to negative three. You can uh, change the FPS code here to be a more reasonable number than one now. Um, we'll be using this code again in a second. Um, but for now, you can change it to 60 or 30 or whatever. Yeah, that's true. When you install uh, Visual Studio, if you didn't select Unity, then, um, or didn't select like install the stuff for Unity, then it won't recognize a lot of stuff for, for Unity or like pop up with suggestions and things. Input is a class in Unity that lets you tap into Unity's in built-in input detection. Um, and get access is a method that lets you pick which input you'd like to, to get from the input system. So next, we had from the Intro to Unity workshop, the script there, there were two options of movement. There was moving, which is like actually just moving the cube around, and tumbling, which was making it rotate in a weird way. So to pick between those, we're going to add some public booleans by typing public bool moving. It's true. Public bool tumbling. Cool, false. Um, so a couple things. Boolean, if you do not know, is a binary input. It can be true or false. Uh, think like a light switch. It can only be up or down unless you were uh, a, a bad child um, and tried to get it stuck in the middle, but normally they're just up or down. So this can be true or false, and that's really useful for, for logic and keeping track of values that only need to be one of two possible values. Also notice that we gave these variables a value right away, and we didn't here. Um, that's kind of a case-by-case -case basis thing, where is it, is it smart to give a variable a default value? Um, in this case, it doesn't really harm anything, but like in the case of like a rigid body, um, we need to get the value of that at runtime instead of giving it a default value at the very beginning of the class. So it depends on the the variable on whether you want to give it a default value or not, but for these booleans, it's fine. All right, and so let's put all these variables and stuff that we've made together, so, and we'll say if we're moving dot velocity some movement, and then if we're tumbling be dot angular velocity movement. Okay, so what we did here is conditional logic. So we had our Boolean values here that are only true or false, and we're saying if that conditional, which we're using our Boolean, is true, then we're going to set this aspect, this data of our rigid body, um, to be the vector three that we made and we filled the values in for. And if this value of tumbling is true, we're going to set the angular velocity of our rigid body um, to be equal to the movement vector that we've been filling. So yeah, and now that we've got this written, we can go back into Unity. And if you've got your frame rate set to a decent one, like we did a minute ago, we can hit play. And I've got gravity turned on. You can turn off gravity with the rigid body there. And now you can move your cube around. The cube is very slow. How might we want to fix a slow cube? Well, maybe we want to give a number. Uh, called movement speed. was 5.0 F. Uh, there might be a little confusion here with floats. I know when I first got into programming, I didn't really know what a float was. A float essentially 
uh, for the for our cases here for our use case just means that it's going to be a number with a decimal point um, with some form of precision uh, between five and six in this instance um, it's 5.0 we could make it 5.1 5.2 whatever um, but it's going to have a decimal place and we put an f to note to denote that it's a, a float value um, my understanding is that a double is a very similar thing to a float, but it just has a higher precision. It has more storage space. If you don't put the F, I'm not actually sure what happens if you don't put the F sometimes. It, it, sometimes it just yells at you. Yeah, it'll just, it looks like it does just default to a double in that instance. It recognizes it as a double and it yells at you for saying, hey, you said this was a float, but it's not. So if you get an error and it seems weird and you don't know why, um, look at it and see if your floats have Fs because um, that can catch you sometimes. So to make our cubes go faster, we just multiply the movement times the movement speed. And now we can go back to our project and move around and moves much faster. F, you know, five times faster, I suppose. Cool. And if we check the tumbling option while we're in here, it gets all funky. So people who know game programming might see that we're doing something wrong here. Um, and what we're doing is we're putting our movement code in update. And if you remember, I update is tied to the frame rate um, and we're moving in accordance with the frame rate. Can anybody think of why that might not be a great idea? Good answers in. If the frame rate drops, then that's, that's a bad, that's a mess. Yeah, if your physics are tied to frame rate, your physics can go wonky. Yeah, so I'm going to share a video. <laughs> This might give you an idea of, of things that could happen if you tie your to your physics. is like stretched between dimensions. I don't know what's going on. So what's happening here is that this person must have gotten a fancy new 144 hertz monitor and they're trying to get Skyrim to run at 144 hertz, 144 frames per second. And um, physics are a little bit tied to the frame rate or the refresh rate. <laughs> and physics are tied to the frame rate and it ruins everything because it's going the physics are going at twice the speed that they should be or at least some of them are and so everything is gets really messy there so one thing we can do about that is introduce a new method a new function into this class um, called fixed update. We shouldn't trash talk Fallout 76 too much. We had a club, club alumni work on that game. Um, and pop. So if you just copy, cut and paste your if conditionals into there, uh, into fixed update, and I'll leave a little comment as to what this does. Fixed update, instead of running once per frame, this function uses the frequency of Unity's physics system. It has its own separate timeline, something that we're looking at doing in game engines right now, actually. Um, it has its own timeline in independent of frame rate, specifically just for the physics system, so that when you do physics-related things in this, it's constant between different frame rates. Oh, and I was going to actually show before, before we do this, I was going to show. Oh my gosh. Go back. All right. It's going to show in the editor if we set this. So it's at 60 right now. And I'm going to just wait. 
what is, what is wrong? What have I done? What have I destroyed? No, we're good. We're good? No. Semicolon. All right, so I'm going to move this guy off the screen, and we're going to time it. So one, two, about two seconds. Two seconds to move it to the left off the screen. Um, and if we limit the frame rate to one, instead, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. It took like five seconds to get off of the screen instead of the two that it took earlier. So we want people to be moving at the same rate even if their frame rates are differently. They're running on different machines. You, you want it to be independent of that so that the same expected behavior happens regardless of your frame rate. So by doing that in fixed update instead, which runs, runs at the frequency of the, the Unity physics system. Did I miss a semicolon again? Yep. Now if we set this back to 60 and we do our same test, So one, two, two seconds, just like before, to get off the screen. Um, but now, if we change the frame rate to one, should be about two seconds once it gets going. One, two, two, three. So once it got good and going, it was a lot closer. And I mean, you move things down to one frame per second, now it's gonna get really screwy, but it's a lot, it's a lot closer to our desired outcome. Um, and the movement's gonna be on an independent timeline instead of tied to the, to the frame rate. We can change that back to a reasonable number now. You shouldn't have to mess with target frame rate because this, in, in the actual application of this, besides showing off frame rate, would be to tie your game to a specific frame rate, but we actually don't need this. No, I don't think I use this again. No, don't need this. And since that was all that's in our start method, we can get rid of that completely. And we're good. The velocity, the move, yeah. Because we've got in our code. So cool. This is essentially the script from the intro to unity lecture there's like a couple minor differences like in that one instead of setting the rigid body here you can do that through code um so if you have your void start uh you can get your rigid body rb is game object um and game object is kind of like saying this um well this would be the script a game object is like one step above script. It's the object. So when you type game object in this script, we're really talking about gra grabbing the game object player. Um, and then to get the rigid body, you can do dot get component rigid body. That should be it, right? Yeah. So you could set your rigid body that way as well, and it works just as fine. Um, so you don't have to have that be public. But um, yeah, and there's very few differences between this script and the one that we gave you in the intro to Unity to introduce you to the whole engine. Um, so now you've basically got the skill set to learn more about programming. Um, or to learn more about Unity programming in particular, C Sharp, very interesting language, like Java, but better. Uh, but before we quit, I'd like you to look over your code. I always do this when you're done coding. Look at your code and see, like, is it easy to read? Is it nice to look at? Like, um, is your code spaghetti? Is it garbage? If you don't like the answer to those questions, take the time to, to make some comments. It's like setting up variables for movement. So only do this section if the player has the moving checkbox. Like add comments to, to make it nice so that next time when you come back with a way refreshed mind, you're not gonna be 
do this section, you're not going to be confused because that happens a lot, a lot. Like just a, just a life tip, take notes. And this is your way of doing it with programming. Take notes so that you're not confused when you come back and eventually work on this. Because if you are confused when you come back and start working on it, it's going to not, uh, it's going to make you not want to keep working on it. And that's probably how a lot of projects die is that people just get really into it. They write up a bunch of things, but then they don't keep track of it and they get really intimidated and they don't know where to go next and, and the project just kind of dies. So the, a very simple way to help prevent that is to, to comment up your code. Really quick, uh, a couple more resources. Um, I've included them in the outline. So the time has come brackies. and you're ready to write your classic, first lines of code. Classic brackies. Um, he's got a series called How to Program in C Sharp. I've seen the first episode. I haven't seen the rest of them. I've been meaning to watch them, but um, there's like a seal of quality associated with brackies. You know it's going to be something good. So um, check that out. Uh, while you're programming, you, a phrase that applies a lot is you don't know what you don't know. You have no idea if you want to do something, but you don't know the tools to get there. The documentation is a good place to start. You can just look in the manual, like movement. I don't actually know how this search bar works, but in, in the documentation, it's going to have classes and methods and you can get start of an, the start of an idea. Man, this is slow. All right. You can get a bit of an idea. It can be a little hard to do, hard to find some things. And that's where Brackies comes in, um, in YouTube and tutorials. But if you just need to know something about a class, yeah, um, you can Google it and pick the Unity result. Part of being a programmer, especially, is just knowing how to Google really well. Like um, finding your resources and using them effectively is, is more prevalent than using code a lot of the time. I also included the other playermovement.cs, the one we gave you in the intro to Unity. Since that was already in Google Drive, I just linked it in the outline for this. Um, so you can reference that if you ever want to come back to this and try it again. Well, I think we're good then. Um, with that note, I'll give it back to Joseph. And if he's got any closing remarks, he can say them. If not, we'll go to Taco Bell. <laughs>